Bob Costas was there for that World Series, handling the pregame coverage for NBC's coverage of the World Series. Uh, Bob and Tommy knew each other pretty well, and as we mourn the passing of a baseball icon today, we're pleased to have Bob with us. Uh, Bob, thanks for taking some time. I, I want to ask you specifically about your experiences with Tommy during that World Series, but mm -hmm. just open with your thoughts on, on Tommy and his place in the baseball lexicon. Well, genuinely, I don't think it's an overstatement in the aftermath of this news. One of the great characters in the history of sports, and before the break, I heard you and Harold talking about how we'd never see another one like him. Of course, he was a unique personality in any era, but there were managers who were stars and big personalities. Analytics, and this is not a get-off-my-lawn thing, analytics has its place, it's important, but analytics has taken a lot of that out of it. The great managers would often go on gut feeling. Um, maybe that could be criticized. However, it was part of what made them who they were. And when you talk about that World Series in 1988, and the only reason the story involves me, but it typifies Tommy, and that's why uh, it should be told, the Dodgers were huge underdogs, and rightly so. Kirk Gibson had only the one at-bat in that World Series, the dramatic home run. By the time they get to Game 4, their second biggest power threat, Mike Marshall, is also out of the lineup. You take a look at that lineup. I think Dave Anderson was at third base. Alfredo Griffin, who had been a very good player with Toronto back end of his career, is a shortstop. Rick Dempsey, terrific player with the Orioles, again, back end of his career, late 30s, is the catcher. Franklin Stubbs is in that lineup. Mike Davis, who had been a power threat with Oakland, but had only three homers and hit around 200 that year for the Dodgers, is in the outfield. And Mickey Hatcher, who had two home runs in the series after hitting, I think, one or two the entire season, because that's the kind of miracle it was, he's in left field. So I look at the lineup and I see that Canseco and McGuire individually each have more home runs than the Dodgers' entire lineup. So I come on the air and I say, I did not say this is the worst team ever to take the field. Tommy knew I didn't say that, but he used it to his advantage. I was very careful in what I said. First of all, they're up two games to one, and they got Hershiser the next day. So to say that they didn't have a chance to win the series would be nuts. So I say, pitching aside and Dodger pitching is excellent. This may be, in the absence of Marshall and Gibson, the weakest lineup, lineup ever to take the field for a World Series game. Now, when I say this, I'm not thinking that Lasorda and the Dodgers are watching it on the TV in the Visitor's Clubhouse in Oakland. Somebody else would have let it pass. But Tommy being Tommy did a great Tommy thing. Look at that! Even Costas doesn't give us a chance. And then, like this is some <laughs> thing or, or some old B movie about Newt Rockney, he starts a chant. Kill Costas! Kill Costas! Okay. The pregame show ends. And I can't get off the field before the national anthem, so I don't want to be disrespectful. So I find myself standing at the end of the Dodgers line in front of the first base dugout next to Hershiser, who's the next night's pitcher. And he looks down at me with his cap over his heart, and he says out of the corner of his mouth, boy, Tommy really got the guys going over what you said. And I'm thinking, well, what did I say? So he plays it for all it's worth. But he's winking at me out of the corner of his eye. So they win the game. And that game, by the way, was the Tommy Lasorda tour de force. Considering the stage, if you had to look at one thing that exemplifies Tommy at his best, he gave Mike Davis the hit sign on 3-0, and and Davis, who had three home runs all year, homered. They scored on a squeeze play. Every rabbit that could be pulled out of a hat, he did it. So they stole game one with Gibson. They stole game four with Lasorda's maneuvers, and they had Hershiser who won game two and game five, and they win the World Series over the heavily favored Oakland A's. After this game four is over, Marv Albert is interviewing Tommy. And the first thing Tommy says is, you should name Bob Costas the MVP of the game. So I walk over from the other side of the field, and Tommy <laughs> shakes my hand. He's winking at me. He's not mad at all. He says, I'll call you again when we need you. But meanwhile... Tony LaRusso gets the news of this in dribs and drabs. I got to go into LaRusso's office before game five and explain to him that this was not a setup, that Tommy and I were not in cahoots to help the Dodgers and hurt the A's. So that's, that's the kind of thing that it was. <clears throat>
Uh, that's, a, that's a phenomenal story, Bob. And, and, and you can, we can go on and on and on, and we will, telling stories about Tommy Lasorda. But I, you have to have another story, because I'm sure just being around, and I have no idea what you're going to say here, but do you have a, a, a Tommy Lasorda, like, pregame conversation telling you, this guy's the greatest player I've ever seen? Because he said oh, that yeah. about so many different players. Yeah, it just depended upon who he was talking to and what day it was. And the rules were a little looser. As the trials, uh, the commissioner's office cracked down. And, of course, members of the press could be in there. I could be in there. But you used to be able to have friends and relatives and whatnot. And it was not unusual to be in the Dodger clubhouse in the 80s. In the 80s, yeah. By the 90s, it was forbidden. But you could walk in there, and Don Rickles could be in his office. Or Frank Sinatra could be in his office. That's just kind of the, the way it was. And Tommy might very well, half an hour before the game, be having pasta and meatballs and invite you to sit in and, and enjoy the feast. Manja. Ah, the game's a half an hour away. We'll be fine. That was the kind of atmosphere that it was. And you know, he said uh, to me in that, go, go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish your story. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, he, you broke up for a sec. Okay. So... He, he might, as I was saying, he, he sit there literally having a big Italian meal half an hour before the game. And, and I asked him about his temper because he did have a volatile temper. And he said, I will throw anything. I'll throw a chair. I'll throw a bat. I'll throw a locker. But I will not throw a morsel of food. That is absurd. You, you know, you, you stumbled on something there, Bob, that uh, I want to expand on a little bit. For a, a guy that was born in Pennsylvania, as Tommy was, and who traveled all over the country as kind of a baseball vagabond before landing in, in with the Dodgers and, and getting to Los Angeles, there could not have been a more perfect character for that vintage of Dodger baseball. 70s and 80s, the Dodgers were as a sexy a destination and as sexy a thing as there could have been in L.A., along, the, along with every movie star and entertainer that you just mentioned. I mean, he was perfect for that time, not only that franchise. Yeah, that's a really good observation. And, of course, it's essential that those Dodger teams were very, very good. They were always in contention. If they were a mediocre team, then the whole atmosphere would have been different. But I will tell you this. I was around Tommy dozens and dozens of times. Big games, playoffs, World Series, but also regular season games in May and June. And he was always buoyant. He always, you know, even on, in the off years, he always had a bounce of his step. He was always optimistic. It's going to be turned around tomorrow. And I don't mean to embarrass Keith, and he's going to say to me later, Dad, why did you bring this up? I can still see a 40-year-old Keith Costas during spring training in Florida, and I bring him to the ball game. And by four years old, he knew the lineups, not just of the Cardinals, but of other teams. And we're in Tommy's office in the spring training site. Uh, it couldn't have been in Vero Beach. They must have been playing the Cardinals uh, at Al Lang Stadium in, in St. Petersburg. And he has Keith on his knee in his office, and he's saying, now repeat after me, I love the Dodgers. I love the Dodgers. <laughs> and Keith, with an empty smile, looks at him and says, I love the Cardinals. <laughs> he wasn't buying it. Man, that's a, that's a firm kid to not fall under Tommy's spell at the age of four. Hey, Bob, we appreciate the phone call today uh, and, and at the last minute joining us here for your thoughts on uh, such an important baseball figure and such a sad day for the game. Bob, thanks for the, uh, for the visit today.